Old Christmas. There is a villain in this piece, and I am that villain. I was eight. Therefore, the year was 1968. It was Christmas. So Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy were dead. Nixon had been elected, and the White Album had been released. I was halfway through third grade. My grandmother on my father's side had done something unusual. Instead of arriving on Christmas Eve, she'd already been at the house two or three days. She and Aunt Kate, both 79, helped my mother with various things that Christmas season. They'd driven from Arlington, New Jersey, today known as Kearney, in their white gloves, heavy coats, and crushed velvet hats, and spent what seemed to me an amazing amount of time using a sewing machine. My mother had a study then, and there she would make mod outfits from patterns she found at Fabric Bonanza. Every time I went into the study, the sewing would stop and Mom or Nana and or Aunt Kate would say, Don't bother us while we're making Christmas curtains. I was able to picture Christmas curtains. These would have been made out of the vast cuts of fabric Mom had picked out on Sundays when she and Mrs. Vivoda, next door, dragged us to Fabric Bonanza. My brother and I would sit around at Fabric Bonanza while Mom and Mrs. Vivoda flipped through many a bolt of beige, canary yellow, or fraying wine red fabric for hours and hours. We'd be told not to sit on the ledges of the plate glass windows Fabric Bonanza had, overlooking the uh, slush which covered Jericho Turnpike. Mom had fabric from Fabric Bonanza in every drawer of the house. She made a couch covering. <coughs> She made a couch covering she tried to shape to the couch with brass pins which popped out when you'd try to curl up. She bought little plastic buttons she'd sew on our shirts when the buttons fell off, but they weren't flat buttons. They were, from what I could tell, made from the molds used to make golf tees and the sharp plastic edges dug into my rib cage. She also washed our shirts at the same time she washed the fiberglass curtains she'd put up. I itched for weeks in first grade. But this was third grade, and when Mom or Nana or Nana and Aunt Kate told me to go away because they were sewing, I was happy to go away. On Christmas Eve, Nana was unusually distracted. Usually on Christmas Eve, she'd have arrived in mid-afternoon and had a glass of sherry in the living room with Dad and watch as my brothers and I decorated the tree. But this year, what with her having been at the house two days already, she kept leaving the living room and going up into the study. I'd go to the study to see if she'd come back down. I'd knock the sewing machine, or sewing machines, because Mom was starting to collect old ones she'd find at the side of the road, would stop, and the three ladies would say, Don't bother us while we're sewing. Christmas didn't feel like Christmas with Nana staying upstairs while we played my Christmas with the Carolers LP. My aunt and uncle and cousins arrived, and still Nana and Mom and Aunt Kate stayed up in the study like Victorian seamstresses. It was getting toward midnight, and you could hear their footsteps, but no Christmas curtains were hanging anywhere. And if they were fiberglass, I hoped they wouldn't wind up in the wash on Twelfth Night, so all my clothes would be itchy. The next morning, my brothers and I did what we always did on Christmas morning. We sat on the staircase, keeping a very loud silence, early, early, hoping Mom and Dad would wake up and say we could go to the living room and open our stockings. They did that eventually, and as Frank and Bob and I took foam rubber clown, Apache, and hobo masks from our stockings, Nana, Aunt Kate, and my cousins came into the room. But Mom called us to breakfast before we could get to the tangerine in the toe of the stocking. I was impatient to get to the real presents, the ones in packages with From Santa in Mom's handwriting on them. But we had to have bacon and eggs and orange juice and conversation in the dining room. Just before I could run back to the living room, my mother said, Come to the mask room. The mask room? This was not a Christmas room. This was where the family spent most of its leisure time, 364 days of the year. It was where we watched the news and ate supper, except the three or four times in the year when we had meals in the dining room, which had no TV, and where we'd just had our breakfast, which delayed the Christmas present opening. I followed my mother into the mask room. My shoulders stooped to show my misery. There were three or four paper bags with fabric bonanza stamped on them and purple tissue paper overflowing past the handles. These were the bags Mom would often use to put the cracked antique plates, rusted silverware, and unvarnished wooden tools from a hundred years ago after she found them at garage sales. Antique hunting was only a little less tedious than languishing in the recesses of fabric bonanza. 
My grandmother stood by as my mother pointed. Open them, my mother said. I noticed my brothers coming to the door of the mask room. My Aunt Sally peeped through the little window between the kitchen and the mask room, through which plates were supposed to be passed. It was usually blocked by earthenware vessels Mom got at Paddocky's auction, but it was today, one of the places from which a face of a relative peered. What's in these bags, I said. I literally thought I was about to have to carry little curtains into the next room. We never opened presents here. The tree wasn't here. Open them, my, my brother Frank said. I knelt down and started taking tissue paper out of one of the bags. I saw beige fabric and grabbed it, wondering if I'd have to help tack it up on a window sill. But it had a wire or something in it. I saw it had some sort of magic marker streaks, faded. I pulled and saw that it was Tigger from Winnie the Pooh. My mother had read me Winnie the Pooh a few weeks before and had cried when Christopher Robin left the forest. I had told her not to cry on my pajama sleeve, which she'd done at the end of The Little Prince. Tigger's head flopped to the side. The stuffing was so thin, his neck couldn't be supported. I saw Winnie himself, and he was beige in a sallow way. I looked up at all the expectant eyes and said, But they're all old. My mother tried to smile as she said, It's all the Pooh characters. My brother Frank simply said, Fred. Nobody else said anything as I took the Pooh characters one by one out of the fabric bonanza bags. My grandmother looked at me, though, and it was the expression of a woman who knows there are certain people who start out bad and never get better. My grown niece has Winnie now. I never played with him.